Hi, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of cardiovascular drugs, and this is recording part two. Now we're going to talk about vasodilators, and the first class of drugs are the nitrates. Nitrates are drugs that deliver nitric oxide to the vascular smooth muscle, which causes vasodilation. Now, nitric oxide is a normal part of regular endothelial function. It's how your body maintains autoregulation of vascular tone and blood pressure. Uh, there are lots of different drugs that deliver nitric oxide. One example is Viagra, or sildenafil, which increases local availability of the endogenous nitric oxide. Uh, this substance, nitric oxide, can also inhibit platelet aggravation, aggregation or activation or adhesion. And nitric oxide is also rapidly inactivated by hemoglobin. And interestingly, this might explain why it is that patients who have an intracranial bleed, like a subarachnoid hemorrhage, develop vasospasm, because all of that free blood and free hemoglobin binds up the nitric oxide and prevents uh, the endothelial smooth muscle from relaxing, leading to vasospasm. Nitric oxide can be delivered in an inhaled form, and in that case it acts as a selective pulmonary vasodilator. It causes bronchodilation, it improves VQ matching, and this is very useful in patients who have severe pulmonary hypertension or adult respiratory distress syndrome or acute lung injury. Uh, the nitric oxide combines with hemoglobin, as we said, and it forms methemoglobin. And for that reason, patients on inhaled nitric oxide therapy need to have their methemoglobin levels monitored carefully. Patients may also take oral nitrate medications. These include isosorbide mononitrate and dinitrate, known by the brand names Imdur and Isodil. And these are used for prevention of angina pectoris, again due to their nitric oxide causing smooth muscle relaxation, also for treatment of congestive heart failure, and side effects would be also due to vasodilation, so headache or orthostatic hypotension. The two drugs we're going to focus on primarily here are IV drugs. The first is nitroglycerin, which is primary a, primarily a venous dilator. As you can see, this drug has three nitric oxide molecules attached to it, and the nitric oxide is then released through a glutathione-dependent pathway that cleaves these substances. We can use it in order to deliberately lower blood pressure at a surgeon's request during an during a intraoperative procedure. It's not as potent as sodium nitroprusside, which we'll talk about next, but it is um, an option for controlled hypotension. We do expect to see some reflex tachycardia as the blood pressure comes down. Because of the vasodilation, we expect to see cerebral vasodilation, which can increase intracranial pressure and cerebral blood flow and lead to symptoms like headache. You may be asked to administer nitroglycerin in the obstetric setting. It can be used for uterine relaxation, at which point the dose is a relatively high dose of 50 to 200 micrograms as an IV bolus, and patients do tolerate that very well under those circumstances, whereas in the OR, we tend to use lower doses to start. There is some risk of methemoglobinemia with nitrates like nitroglycerin, but it's relatively rare because it's rapidly metabolized in the liver. Uh, just a reminder that the treatment for methemoglobinemia is, of course, methylene blue. So nitroglycerin can be given by many different routes. It can be given sublingually or transmucosally, and the advantage of that is we avoid the first pass effect because absorption through those structures will... Uh, drain into the superior, not the inferior vena cava, thus bypassing the liver. Uh, in those cases, you'll see people getting uh, sublingual nitros, uh, uh, nitroglycerin pills or a spray or some ointment or paste that can be put on the skin uh, for treatment of angina pectoris. This increases perfusion to ischemic parts of the heart uh, that patients may be having, causing the angina. When we give nitroglycerin IV, you may give it as a bolus in order to treat uh, hypotension or for other reasons like we mentioned uh, previously, usually a bolus I'll give anywhere between 10 and 100 micrograms IV. If you run an infusion, you would run it at a rate of somewhere between 0.5 and 2 mics per kilogram per minute. There is some possibility that it absorbs into plastic tubing, and so we recommend that when you spike the nitroglycerin uh, bottle that you run about 10 cc's out through the tubing into the garbage um, in order to bind up any plastic binding sites. Patients do develop some tolerance to nitroglycerin within about 24 hours of ongoing continuous treatment. The other nitrate that we'll discuss is sodium nitroprusside, uh, which is becoming less common, uh, but is still available. And this is a venous and an arterial 
vasodilator. You can see that it has a bunch of cyanide molecules and then one nitric oxide molecule attached as well. Again, it can be used for controlled hypotension, treatment of hypertensive emergencies, cardiac disease. We expect to see the same kind of reflex tachycardia, the same cerebral vasodilation and um, cerebral blood flow. Uh, they say that sodium nitroprusside can attenuate your hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction because of its vasodilator properties and may even cause some coronary steel syndrome whereby it dilates healthy blood vessels but does not dilate diseased coronary blood vessels, thereby shunting blood away from the section of the heart that may be most at risk. The concentration of sodium nitroprusside is the same as nitroglycerin. It's a 250 milligrams in a 250 milliliter um, container, so that's 200 mics per mil. And the starting dose is about the same also. They say about 0.3 to 0.5 mics per kilogram per minute to start, which is usually about 10 mils an hour. And that's a good rule of thumb for these nitrates is if you're not sure where to start them, just run it at 10 mils an hour and then do the calculations when you have a moment to check. The onset is almost instant and a bolus is not usually needed. These drugs um, then last for anywhere from 1 to 10 minutes after you've turned them off. Uh, you titrate it up in increments, usually to a final dose somewhere around 3 mics per kilogram per minute. You can go up to 10 mics per kilogram per minute, but they don't recommend doing that for longer than 10 minutes. Um, if you're going to be running it for longer, they recommend capping around 2 mics per kilogram per minute. Sodium nitroprusside breaks down in light, and so you'll see that the IV bag is usually wrapped in some sort of black plastic or foil, and even the IV tubing should preferentially be kept out of the light. We should definitely use continuous arterial blood pressure monitoring when using nitrates. Just a brief note about the metabolism of sodium nitroprusside. Uh, this is, uh, some of this is important for you to realize, which is really that it's all about the cyanide. Uh, cyanide is toxic, and as we saw from the picture before, there's a lot of cyanide that's released when we administer sodium nitroprusside. Now, what your body does with cyanide is it sequesters it. Your body has a form of hemoglobin called methemoglobin, and methemoglobin is very good at soaking up cyanide, and it, call, it creates something called cyanomethemoglobin. And about 1% of your hemoglobin is naturally methemoglobin, so it's there and ready to sequester cyanide. The cyanide then goes to the liver and the kidneys. It's converted to thiocyanate by an enzyme called, called rhodonese, uh, which requires sulfur, usually thiocyanate, and then it's excreted in the urine. Now, if your body can't manage that, you develop cyanide toxicity, and that's what we just need to be aware of. And this is in bold because you do need to know that sodium nitroprusside can cause cyanide toxicity, especially if your liver isn't working 100%. Um, if you have any suspicions that a patient on sodium nitroprusside is developing cyanide toxicity, you don't wait for lab results, you treat it right away. Um, the earliest sign would be acidosis, and that's because uh, what cyanide does is it gets into your mitochondria and it inactivates your cytochrome oxidase, so your oxidative phosphorylation can't occur. So basically you have lots of oxygen available, but your mitochondria are unable to use it. So you go into anaerobic metabolism, start forming a lot of lactate, and you develop a lactic acidosis. Uh, they sometimes recommend using bicarbonate to treat that acidosis. Uh, cyanide can also decrease the ability of hemoglobin to bind oxygen. Down the line, people develop tachycardia, changes in mental status, um, seizures, and then they'll become hypertensive because of tachyphylaxis um, due to ongoing exposure to the sodium nitroprusside. This is really what you need to know um, for the exam and probably for boards. Um, just to finish the discussion, though, the treatment of cyanide toxicity, of course, is to stop the sodium nitroprusside. Uh, the next step would be to give some sort of a nitrite, either sodium nitrite or amyl nitrite. Uh, they buffer the cyanide, and the way they do that is they actually create methemoglobin, and you get about 10% levels instead of the usual 1%. So you have lots of extra methemoglobin that can sequester that cyanide, and so actually we want to follow patients' methemoglobin levels when we're treating them for cyanide toxicity, and we want to see that they have about 10% uh, methemoglobin or less. If it exceeds 10%, that tells us there probably isn't any cyanide left to sequester. There's no need for any further nitrate therapy. The next step would be then to ramp up that rhodonese enzyme. So we give sodium thiosulfate. That creates more rhodonese, which can convert the cyanide into thiocyanate. And again, it's renally excreted. Just as another point, uh, vitamin B12, which is called hydroxocobalamin, 
can also chelate cyanide and lead to renal excretion. So that's another possible treatment for cyanide toxicity. Again, I don't think you really need to memorize any of this, but you do want to understand that cyanide toxicity does uh, is a common uh, side effect that we watch for in patients getting sodium nitroprusside. We'll stop there. Please contact me with any questions, and we'll continue in the next video.